Greetings. I'm Justin Rothschank, here to invite you to join me and more than 40 other potters from around the country for the 11th annual Michiana Pottery Tour on September 24 and 25. You'll find a list of all the participating potters, links to all our web stores for online shopping, a tour map, and more information at michianapotterytour.com or on our Instagram page at Michiana Pottery Tour. I hope to see you there. Welcome to the Tales of a Red Clay Rambler podcast, featuring interviews with culture makers from around the world. This has been Carter. I'm going to be your host. If you'd like more information on the show, please visit our website, talesofaredclayrambler.com. Welcome back to episode 435 of the podcast. Thank you all for tuning in. Today on the show, I'm talking with artist and educator Kathy King. Her graphic ceramics often depict relationship dynamics through a feminist lens. In our interview, we talk about her early sculptural work around reproductive rights, how she matches images to form, and her day job running the ceramic studio at Harvard University. For more information, you can visit her website. That's kathykingart.com. Also, I wanted to thank the folks that have recently donated to our podcast. We are listener supported, so I'd like to thank Rebecca Harvey, Lynn Day Brown, and Wansu Kim. If you'd like to get involved yourself, you can do that at the website. That's talesoveredclayrambler.com slash donate. Without further ado, we'll get to the interview. So I thought that we would go back to your grad school days, and you thankfully sent me some images of work that I have never seen. It was great to see a progression of the work over the years. And your thesis piece, one of the main things was a birth control bed, which was huge. I mean, it's like a full-size bed yes. with ceramic components. <laughs> so can you talk about that project? Yeah, yeah. It's it's interesting, you know, as you grow old uh, and, uh, you know, looking over <laughs> almost 25 years of work, it's um, there's only so much you can share online without seeming like your own museum. So <laughs> it's, I, I haven't really, you know, had those images out for a while, but that uh, thesis work was really important to me. I had gone to um, grad school at University of Florida, go Gators, and um wanted to work with uh pottery basically i want i went there thinking i was going to be a wood fire potter who would ultimately live in the middle of the woods in north uh, new hampshire with seven golden retrievers but (laughs) when i got there i was really lucky that um actually linda arbuckle the professor there was gone at the time george bows was doing a sabbatical replacement and was just you know, when you meet that person or that educator who is just that right person saying the right things at that time. And he was incredibly influential um, to my thinking and, you know, came into the studio one day and just said, you know, you just don't seem like the humble brown potter. (laughs) You know, you kind of talk a lot, you know, you're, you're cut up. So, you know, what other things are you interested in? And so that progression of the conversation between um, my love of woodcut uh, and lino cut, graphic novels, it's all progressed to a point of um, working towards narrative. And um, before even grad school, I worked at the 92nd Street Y for years. And I was intru- I really consider that my undergrad education. I was introduced to um, the work of Mark Burns, Matt Nolan, um, and people who were working with really, you know, at that time, somewhat controversial uh, subject matter of sexuality and being gay. And all these things just like, 
made me feel like I could have a voice in this conversation. But as a woman, I didn't really know where to start. And this idea of what is hidden in the medicine chest cabinet, what is not presented in the common spaces of your home versus what is, you know, carefully tucked away was kind of the starting point and thinking about all the things I had to make decisions about regarding um, birth control uh, at the time I was dating men. And um, that, you know, it just seemed funny to me for some reason. It's like, oh my God, it's like, oh, the, a diaphragm, really? You want me to do what with what? And so <laughs> turning this idea of like, I started with a diaphragm container and I was doing a butter dish demonstration for a class with Linda Arbuckle. And I said, oh my God, this could be like a diaphragm container. And that's where it started. And I made the birth control pieces in, you know, these little pots individually to hold birth control pills and um, uh, birth control tests. And then it was like, where do you put this stuff? You know, do you put it on a pedestal? Do you put it on a shelf on the wall? That just seemed not right. So to create this interior space that you could walk into and almost read like being immersed in a graphic novel was the impetus to create furniture. So I started building this terribly put together plywood furniture, but I made it very structurally sound by tiling every inch of it. <laughs> so the thing was like, I don't know, 400 pounds by the end of it, but <laughs> it all came apart. <laughs> So I w before I want to have more questions about this, but did, did you ever talk to your mom about birth control? Because her generation was the first to have accessibility to the pill, which was a humongous deal at that totally. moment. Totally. Absolutely. Yes. And my mom, you know, in, in, I grew up outside of Boston, about half an hour in the burbs. And at my high school, just to put it into context there, you know, every homeroom was kind of alphabetical. So like A through D by your last name, we had like four homerooms for the letter O for the O'Malley's, the O'Brien's, the <laughs> O'Leary's. And I was absolutely a bizarre, uh, you know, entity at this high school because I only, it was only my sister and myself. And that's because my mom wanted to have kids, but she also went back to work. And so I was kind of a latchkey kid and, you know, cleaning and cooking when I came home from school. And so, yeah, she was, she was pretty open um, and supportive about, uh, you know, talking to me about these things. I remember, uh, you know, when I re I got the a copy of Our Bodies Ourselves, you know, that was like, you know, and then there <laughs> were lots of questions, which she, you know, fielded to the best of her ability. But <laughs> so when, when you think about the, the thesis work, that was in 1995 in Gainesville, Florida, which is a, a liberal town in the middle of a pretty conservative area. Like North Florida is much closer to South Georgia in terms of the cultural totally, vibe. Yeah. Um, what was the reaction to that work? Well, you know, I think it's like being in the bubble of grad school. Um, it felt like a very safe place. I remember, um, I remember getting some eye rolls from some of the other grads. It's like, oh my God, we've got to talk about this again, just in terms of the subject matter, the work, it took a long time to create the installation. Um, so I, I got it and uh, I understood, but um, I felt it was just so exciting to me to create something that I hadn't seen already. Um, you know, it would be, years you know i just searched i searched um uh, what did we have back then you know like a couple of ceramic magazines and a bunch of books before you know the inner <laughs> and the, yeah that piece was made in 98 and that was like right when you, i got my first email right at university of wow. florida so i know god i'm ancient Jeez. <laughs> um yeah so you know to try and find examples of women in ceramics that were working with similar subject matter that were um even though i wasn't out yet you know women who were gay in ceramics couldn't find a thing until years later when paul matu's sex pots came out um and that was such an important book but even with that book i couldn't find i i was kind of disappointed by the number of women that were represented and then add insult to injury 
because by this time I had come out that uh, Paul Mathieu called me the straight version of Matt Nolan. Oh, God. Right? <laughs> so Paul Mathieu, if you're out there, <laughs> I'm never <laughs> forgiven you for that. But that really did kind of call me out in terms of like, wow, all right. So if if what I'm doing is notable enough to be talked about in a book, I also have to like deal with people misrepresenting me and or making assumptions about me. And because I do work and did work for a number of years based on reproduction, but I myself have always known I did not want to have kids and that I was gay, you know, but does that mean I can't you know, make work or comment on uh, the impact of uh, birth control and making decisions about um, controlling your body's ability to reproduce. Yeah. And ultimately in the South, this is still a fight. I mean, yeah. Roe oh, versus God, Wade yeah. just fell. And this is still, do you have autonomous control over your body as a woman in America? And the answer is it depends on where you live, which is insane. But it, that's the reality on the ground. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I was being in at in Florida, and then later in 2000, uh, moving to Atlanta to teach at uh, Georgia State University. And I was there for 10 years. I mean, I was really immersed in the South. Um, the thing about, you know, being in an urban environment like Atlanta was that there was more conversation there was more understanding about um uh you know lgbtqia rights and women's rights and whatnot so i was fortunate to be able to be in that conversation but the work was not you know i had done lectures at like uh colleges and universities around outland atlanta and it was like crickets you know i could give a slideshow <laughs> at georgia state and people are laughing and they get it and um i could go to a small town in rural georgia and i i thought i was going to be run out of town so i quickly got an idea you know and it was almost like why did you invite me um uh but i really got that these are sensitive topics. And though I'm presenting it with humor as like a point of seduction, like come over here, I want to tell you something important, but we're going to kind of joke about it at the same time. Um, I think that gave an entryway into the work. But when it really came down to me being serious and talking about, you know, a woman's right to choose and abortion rights and whatnot, then then the room got really quiet. <laughs> <laughs> so part of this too is leaning on the language, the graphic language of comics, graphic novels, other types of things that going back, I guess, to the twenties or maybe even before they had, you know, serious topics, but the characters are always kind of winking and nodding, you mm -hmm, know, like they mm -hmm. would talk about death or talk about war, but it was like with a smile on their face and like a, we're going to go get them attitude. So which graphic novels or comics comics are you draw or I, I know you've been working for decades now, but like mm -hmm. what what pool are you drawing from in terms of the aesthetic language of all of that? Right. Well, I think, you know, in the 90s, uh, being aware of kind of the granddaddy of adult alternative comics was um, R. Crumb. And, you know, even before the movie came out, a documentary and people became really aware of them, I, you know, was reading Zapped and some early work and just seeing the misogynistic way he depicts women. You know, he, of course, is kind of making a joke that he's like this wimpy, skinny guy and all women are like these Amazonian, like, brick house, you know, um, built women uh, that he's lusting after. That was um, a real point of um, contemplation about like how I felt about this. Like, am I bad for reading this? I don't agree with it, but I like the humor. So that was very confusing. So then I went and started to look further for other artists and I found um, a graphic novelist, uh, Julie Duche. And that was like a graphic novel about having like a never ending period. 
um, about, you know, just being like raw and dirty and, you know, thoughtless sex and um, jumping from one person to the other. And it was, it really was like that look, looking inside the medicine chest cabinet when you're over somebody's house to see if they have better pills than you do. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so that, uh, you know, that was really influential to me. And then to, you know, for genre or for color scheme, you know, anybody like uh, uh, somebody like Charles Burns, who works with kind of a teen horror genre. Um, I grew up reading Tales of the Crypt, Vampirella, um, you know, highly uh, influential in kind of the symbology that I use in the work. I also um, am the daughter of uh, a man who builds hot rods and I've grown up around hot rod culture. So when you see the skulls and dice and flames and pinups and all that uh, good stuff, that's like the language of my youth. And so being able to identify that with certain graphic novelists was like, Oh, okay, I'm home. And also I think just to, to round that out, you know, the pedestrian part of graphic novels, the fact that they were affordable, you know, that you could get it easily. It just seemed like, ah, oh, this is such an exciting art form. There are some times in which your work is is broadcasting ide an idea like the birth control um, bed, but then there's other series of work that is about relationships. So you've got, um, there was a series of plates on the wall that is um, sort of people in relationships with other people, but they had animal heads. Like one, one part of the couple had an animal head. From that, I can extrapolate out like this is about human relationships versus telling me an idea. So can you talk about how you've changed in the way you portray relationships over time and also just about that work itself? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's interesting and complex in terms of when I started and I did not feel comfortable within myself to use the subject matter that I was using and say, slip in a same sex couple, even though that was what I was experiencing in my personal life. So a lot of the work that I was doing around reproduct uh, reproduction and having kids and whatnot, it was um, depicting a lot of heterosexual couples. And then as I progressed in into, you know, the 2010s and um, teens, um, I felt very comfortable depicting same sex couples and working with the idea of sexual labels. And which is really interesting, because there were so <laughs> honestly, there were so few back in my day, you know, it was like, straight gay bi. <laughs> that's that's what we were working with and i and i think about like my wife and i talk about this all the time like if we were teenagers today you know how different our lives would be to have these notions to consider of you know by non-binary and um etc so i i find great um comfort in the fact that this conversation has gotten much broader than what i experienced so the work that you're referring to is was from um, a show that dealt with uh, sexuality and gay culture. And so at that point, um, I was playing around with a uh, level of anonymity and with the idea of a sexual relationship, uh, who is masked, who is being real or not. I think uh, some of that is kind of a, a strange guilt or shame that when I was much younger, I didn't have, I, I wish I had been that person who could have just been out, you know, but I was closeted for many years. And, uh, but I also had wonderful relationships with men that I cherish to this day. So that idea of being masked, I think, um, kind of played into that uh, experimentation with um, using the animal heads on top of uh, a body that you see uh, markers as being female, you know, so it is a same sex couple, but, you know, I'm, I'm kind of twisting it up a little bit by not uh, totally two human women. Those, those uh, plates that you're referring to uh, as well were all based on a different image from art history that uh, depicted two women together. So there was toulouse Lautrec's um, uh, pastel drawing in bed of the two women kissing. And, you know, when you read about uh, that 
pastel or that painting um, in art history, it's often, you know, that they were prostitutes and, you know, they were just really good friends. And it's like, no, (laughs) (laughs) you know, I love in art history, like they must have been sisters, you know, or like they're really close. I'm like, yeah, they're close. All right. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear about the art history connection because there is something compositionally different about the way you approach the border of the plate in the way the figures come across that border than say the bed, you know, which is, Mm -hmm. I know, I know the bed is early, much earlier work, but I'm thinking about like a graphic image can sometimes flatten things because you're using black and white. And on the bed, you got around that by having you, you literally tiled like all of it, you know, like the headboard has tile on it. The, the, uh, footboard has tile on it. There's places to show the work. You're, you're looking at this thing like completely three dimensionally, but then in other times you have a simpler object, like one plate, but then you're drawing in a three dimensional style that really activates that surface. So how, how do you figure that out? Like when you have a idea in your head about like, I want to talk about this topic, how do you choose the way you render it in the way you're making the work? Yeah, I think framing has always been something that I I consider in the work and um, what you're describing to have the skin of a piece, say like that birth control bed, be completely covered, that to me, then it would blur into the environment around it. And even though we know that's not really a bedroom, it might trans bring you to that place. Um, The I think I I got that from Matt Nolan's early work. He had a a piece called Glitter and Be Gay. And you could see like the different panels were kind of framed in a raised edge around um, different imagery. And I I've always thought about that as how well that worked with this idea of a graphic novel. So that if I use side A and side B on a pot, um, maybe that takes it you know, don't have a round pot, like try and flatten each side. So you have a better kind of canvas to work with. Um, Those were important things to think about. As I've continued, though, um, I've tried many different framing devices. I really love this idea of portraiture. I've been making these oval pieces that are clad in uh, copper or aluminum that my wife um, who works with metals creates for them. Um, I've been, I played with that for quite a while. I've played with different metal, uh, edge edges, almost like, um, uh, kind of like a, with rivets and kind of giving up, I don't know, steampunky type of thing. I didn't do that for too long, but the, the pieces that you're describing, I was a very different form for me. I was in a different place. I was doing a residency in Shigaraki when I made those pieces. And I think it was just the, the influence of being in a different place, um, to think about like, okay, rather than seeing the frame, uh, the frame drops down and you consider the three dimensionality of this piece, even though it's wall hung, that you're going to see the, the frame motif, uh, then see, uh, kind of, a, a almost like a, a porthole, uh, into the scene of these, um, beings together. So yeah, that's still something I think about. I really do. I'm, and I'm constantly trying to find a way to, um, I don't know, just not have the work floating out there, but be very intentional on, on what it is that I'm uh, trying to present and how your view of the work is. Are you looking through something? Is it um, set up like you would approach a painting? Um, so there's a lot of wall work. I wish I did still work within that furniture. And I I did a number of different installations after that piece uh, where I tiled furniture. And honestly, it was getting out of grad school and moving around a lot. And, you know, I, and the fact that sometimes you're making work that people are excited about, but they don't necessarily want to buy it which is to this day, the case that I experience. I mean, and you know, I understand nobody wanted a giant tiled birth control bed. So I actually (laughs) slept in it for like five years afterwards. Yeah. Everybody wanted to buy the pots off of it, but they didn't want the whole bed, you know? And I'm very sad that I, I did sell the pots to a collector and, um, it felt really cheap 
You know, it felt like, okay, I, if, if I was a sculptor, would you come in and say, could I have that left-hand corner of this room, <laughs> you know, and I'm going to give you a good price for it. And instead I was just young and I was excited. A collector even cared about my work. Um, so those, those are those lessons you, you learn early on. And it's like, you know, if I had had the money to put that entire piece in storage and to have that to this day and be like, Hey mama, call me. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> I wish I had, but I did not. <laughs> so as a practical measure, let's say you're walking around in the middle of the night, you get up to go to the bathroom, you come back and you like bump your knee on that bed. Are you just like, <laughs> like broken shin? Cause that, that is like a solid ceramic surface. Listen, how was listen, that to ben, live with? That, that, that were, well, it was weird bringing girls over. <laughs> <laughs> so I usually, you know, that was a conversation point in itself. Too. Um, you know, it's, uh, it, I was kind of proud of myself for how long that lasted, you know, a lot, <laughs> lot happened around that bed so that it stayed together. And then I had to dismantle it when um, I left for Atlanta. And I, I honestly, I had some friends have it in storage and I don't know whatever happened to it. Um, it's, it's somewhere out there in the ether. I love the idea that you brought a date home and, and I should describe the footboard has a devil, like mm -hmm. a woman that's has that little devil horns and it says, good luck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I love like a date going, oh shit, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> well, that devil girl, that was a, a direct um, response to our crumb. And so, you know, in, in at that point, I was like, okay, I feel uneasy about our crumb's use of women in um, the graphic novel. So what if I become the devil girl? What if I become that voice and kind of take um, that back? And um, it, it was interesting because when I was making all this work about sex, but I was in grad school. I mean, I was working so hard, dear Lord, I had no time. I wasn't <laughs> having that much fun, you know, and, and it was interesting to have people make assumptions about me. Um, it was interesting. I, the year out of grad school, I was a demonstrating artist at Ensika and I was talking about that work and uh, reproducing. And I remember women yelling from the audience, just do it. Like meaning just have kids. And I had women come up to me during the break and afterwards. And it's like, you know, you're basically saying like that. I'm not a true woman if I don't have kids. I couldn't believe it. And, um, you know, that, that was, it's just been that dance of like, you know, how much do I want to put out there about myself? I really don't mind. It is part of my process to put myself out there and, uh, deal with assumptions and, um, in a way, uh, when things kind of go awry, it just solidifies my confidence in myself and my choices and, um, makes me want to continue making work that is image-based with some sort of message. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Scut is a proud sponsor of the Tales of a Red Clay Rambler. Scut Ceramic Products has been in manufacturing equipment for potters since 1953. Their reputation as a pioneer in innovative kiln design continues with the fourth generation of this family-owned business. Their Kilnmaster touchscreen controller offers a sleek, smartphone-like interface that is both intuitive and packed with powerful tools that allow potters to easily program, diagnose, and remotely monitor their kilns. With five dedicated kiln technicians on staff and the most comprehensive network of distributors across the globe, you can be assured that Scut will be there for you before and after the sale. For more information on their line of kilns, visit scut.com. This episode of the podcast is also sponsored by Amico Brent. For the past 100 years, Amico Brent has been creating ceramic supplies for our community, ranging from underglazes to electric kilns. With over 3,000 products, Amico Brent's top priority is making sure that all of their customer needs are met. From the professional to the student and everyone in between, their high quality materials enable you to make your best work. To learn more, check them out at amico.com or on Instagram and Facebook at Amico Brent. 
You can also show them how you use Amico by sharing your work online with the hashtag HowIAmico. Years ago, we, I think we're having like dinner at Ensika and you talked about that occasionally people will come up to you and say, I'm sorry, your relationship is so bad. Or <laughs> like, I'm sorry, you're struggling because you've made work about relationship troubles. And at that point, you choose to either say, no, actually, I'm happily married like that. This is I'm, I'm working with characters here, folks. I'm not right. <laughs> I'm not literally depicting my own relationship. So talk about that. Yeah, it's it's funny. I remember, God, I'm, I, we got to move out of University of Florida, but um, I've done something since. But I, it brings me <laughs> back there again. I remember sitting after a crit with my my roommate John, and we were having a beer and going over everything that everybody said. And he said, like, well, what do you think you're going to do? Like, just make work about people you date and your body till you hit menopause. And I was like, oh, I hope so. <laughs> you know, and I was real there, you know, it's like, wow, that'd be awesome. And I've done it, Ben. I'm winner, winner, chicken dinner right here. <laughs> you made it. <laughs> <laughs> I made it. Yes. So to be able, you know, I did uh, a few years ago, a menopause series, and it was a series of portrait pieces um, that uh, were trying to talk about menopause, I think I still have some more work coming from that. Because that again, for what birth control was kind of not something we talked about easily in 1998. Uh, menopause, even in 2022, isn't <laughs> really spoken about. I mean, and it sucks. <laughs> like, <laughs> there's hot flashes and your hair's different. And <laughs> It's, it, you know, you have brain fog. It's terrible. <laughs> like, why are we not talking about this? Comforting each other, you know? So the, the different panels were, you know, a, a, it was kind of a pin up theme. So there was a farm girl uh, entitled All Out of Eggs and uh, um, a pin up in a martini glass. That, and it said all dried up in a <laughs> desert landscape, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm trying trying to use that same humor to bring the subject up. So when you talk about people wanting, they like the work, they like the ideas of the work, but they don't necessarily want to buy it. When I think about that series, the menopause series, like as a series in a museum, perfect, you know, cause you, you, you have enough room to display all of it. It, it makes a lot of sense. But if you take one pot out of that, then all the, it's, it's like the bed. It's like you've then, uh, even though it's not exactly the same as the bed, you're kind of destroying the overall thing by breaking it into pieces to sell it. Yeah. And it, you're, you hit the nail on the head. And again, it's, I do have a little bit of shame about this subject because it's, I totally agree. And I, I did have the fortune of having a curator from a museum come and do a studio visit just two months ago. And that was a big problem, you know, that they they loved that series and, you know, and talked to me about um, potentially acquiring work. But and I'm standing there and I'm like, I don't have the whole series. I've got part of it, you know, and it's like, do you, you remake it? I have a I think maybe because I work with such image based, um, uh, you know, content that I I have for a long time for um, things above like mugs and, and functional work that I don't want to repeat things, which is kind of stupid <laughs> in a way. I mean, it's just, this is not <laughs> practical thing. This is why I got a day job. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Um, but yeah, that's really, you know, and I did a piece over um, the pandemic and uh, I, I had donated it just recently to the Penland auction and Penland School of Crafts is such an important, I feel like I grew up there as an artist um, uh, for many years and I always want to support them, but it was a depiction of a devil. Um, you know, fighting this woman who is obviously beat to hell, but she's still in the ring, you know, so that not giving up. And if you look at the devil, he's got like a Trump cartoon, you know, tattoo on his arm. And, you know, I was watching the the auction and I saw like nobody's bidding on this. And I'm like, I, I get it. I mean, I've, 
I've gotten great feedback about the piece, but would I want that in my living room? <laughs> Probably not. I'm just looking for that person with so many vacation homes that they <laughs> <laughs> just need this piece. <laughs> I hope it goes to a good home at some point. Do you think the work could function in another form? So for instance, like as a big mural, as a part of a political action, I feel like that this could be really powerful. Do you ever think in those terms, like, yes, this almost like the pots are a test for the bigger motif somewhere else? Gosh, yeah, that that's such a, you know, great point. And, um, you know, working within the arts in a, a city like Boston, it's like I'm seeing so many amazing mural projects popping up around the city. I think that that's um, a really wonderful and smart way for cities to, you know, support their artists and make our, our surroundings more beautiful. I don't know. There's something, um, I, I guess, like carving clay uh, in the reductive way that I do, aka like Scrafito, is the closest thing to meditation that I have. And I'm like addicted to that action. Um, and so that's just the way it's got to be. I love printmaking, but I don't do as much printmaking. That I get the kind of shot in the arm of doing reductive carving and uh, being able to work with kind of uh, chunkier, more graphic imagery. Uh, but yeah, I keep returning. Oh, that clay. It's such a, <laughs> I mean, I've had, I've had somebody get a tattoo of an image. I've, my, my oh, wife cool. is like, yeah, my wife has taken up, uh, embroidery and she's embroidering images that I'm drawing of, you know, things I might put on a mug. So I, I love seeing other people do something with it. Uh, you know, I've done t-shirt designs and all that type of stuff, but yeah, when it comes to the studio time, which again, I do have um, a pretty crazy day job. So when I um, have that time to be in the studio, um, that I, I need to go to the place that makes me the happiest. Well, let's talk about your day job. Um, you're the direct, actually, you have a really long title. <laughs> essentially, you're the director of the Art Center at Harvard. Right. No, no. What is it? I am the director of the ceramics program, Office of the Arts at Harvard. <laughs> and it is a uh, ceramic center that um, started about 50 years ago at Harvard, back when Radcliffe was all women. It started in 1969. And it kind of flew under the radar. And the unique part of it is that uh, it serves both the Harvard community and the general community. So um, it's this really dynamic um, mix of people. Uh, but we offer non-credit classes uh, to um, to people three semesters a year. And uh, it's kind of a cross between a college department, like a ceramics department and a community center. So on top of those non-credit classes, I work with over nine different departments at Harvard uh, doing academic collaborations. Um, we work with everyone from art history to anthropology to uh, engineering and uh, architecture. It's That's the coolest part of my job is to be able to have that um, kind of point of uh, intersection where people stumble upon the ceramic material, whether it's staring at an image on a screen, you know, in their anthropology class, or it's working with conservation scientists at the museum who are, you know, asking us, can you tell us if this was thrown or not, you know, this ancient pot, you know, and being able to touch it and hold it and, oh, it's just dreamy. The, the museums there are, are pretty amazing. And you, you hosted a live show of this podcast that we did years ago with Ethan Lasser and mm -hmm. who was Ezra Shales. Ezra Shales, yeah. And that is the most nervous I have ever been for a live event. Man, I was thinking of that this morning because I, you know, I was thinking about what a fan of the show I've been, you know, since the beginning I've been listening. And I remember those were early days. And I, I was thinking like, wow, this was kind of 
when you were figuring out what this could be, you know, and it's like, so we both came up with this idea of kind of having this panel and having these scholars rather than the makers come into the space and talk. And I was a nervous wreck as well, because I was like, I don't know if this feel nothing against them at all, but I just did. I don't know if that was right. You know, it was kind of like I missed the maker perspective, which is what you celebrate and what you showcase. Well, thanks for listening all these years. And also, yeah, no problem. <laughs> thanks for having the panel. I mean, the, the thing that the reason I brought that up is that that's a good example of you melding the academic some I don't want to say academics are out of touch, but your average person that goes to Boston is not going to think I'm going to go talk to a director of the Harvard Museum. Like, it's just not possible. That seems out of right. reach. But what the Art Center does is it is a bridge between kind of your normal folks that are into art and the academics, whether that's art history you mentioned or conservation or, or whatever it is. Where do you see that collaboration work well? And where do you see it not work so well? Because you've been in this job for a while now. I, I have. Think, right? Yeah, I think I'll, I'm, I'm going to hit 10 years in a, a year or two. The, where it works well for me personally is is that ability to kind of turn people on to that this is not so easy, you know, to have um, to work with the Graduate School of Design on a course. Um, at the beginning, it did not work well because we, in bringing these architecture and engineering students into our space and saying, as part of your course, you're going to learn how to use robots and CNC routers and laser cutters, but the professor wants you to do all that with the ceramic material. I was a little too shy at that point to say, okay, you all got to take this seriously because this <laughs> stuff is cracking all over the place. And and it was kind of the mentality of the students. Too. I remember one day I was in my office and the, this group of four came in to my doorway and they said, um, we have two hours and we wanted you to teach us how to throw so that we can teach the robot. And I was like, no. <laughs> like, where, like, what am I doing? Am I giving you this idea that it's that easy? Like, what? So I, I immediately had to, like, change my approach to that course. And it's like, no. To, and say to the professor, listen, they think that this is super easy. You know, they rolled a snake in second grade and they think they've got this down. Um, so I was like, no, we need orientation. You know, so now we have like four sessions of, you know, one just on mold making and slip casting, one about how clay behaves, you know, just explaining why this is important to re refer to leather hard or cheese hard and bone dry and greenware and all that good stuff. Um, so my approach needed to improve over time. The honestly, the, the area I have the hardest time is with the art department. And um, we don't, I, I would say that that's still a uh, relationship that's being nurtured. Um, the students, uh, I'll get one or two students over. There, there's a geographical um, challenge in that our program is part of the new Harvard campus in what's called Alston, and it's across the Charles River from Harvard Square. So um, it is hard for them to t get you know a whole class over to our space because it's a whole mile away <laughs> oh god a whole <laughs> <No>. mile <laughs> a whole mile i know for a 20 year old it's impossible it just is so <laughs> so that's an area that um i'm i'm trying to nurture but i think everything that we've done with the harvard art museum um in terms of trying to find um uh, a way to invite the public into a making moment around say an exhibition we had a wonderful uh run with a, a exhibition by um suzanne ebbinghouse who's one of the uh, curators and professors there at harvard art museum and it was called animal headed drinking vessels and it was everything from metal to ceramic it was um uh, ancient pieces from many different cultures. And uh, I worked uh, with our artist and resident at the time, Salvador Jimenez Flores, who um, was just so amazing and making these molds of pieces that we could invite the public to create their own. And, um, you know, some days we don't want to dumb anything down, but the 
the change that happens in somebody from just staring at an object all the time to actually involving themselves in touching it and moving it around and, and experiencing the material is, is really amazing. And it's not just for the average museum goer. I mean, I'm talking about these world famous curators, you know, and professors who have never actually touched or used the material that they have written books and articles about. Um, and that over time has been funny too, because now I have much more confidence in terms of reading, um, say an article about a piece that might be in the collection and saying, I don't know where they came up with this, but there is no way someone would have made it that way. And then I'll do it. You know, I'll, I'll do a throne version, a hand built version. You know, this is what, in my opinion, the maker would have had in their mind. And, um, that uh, evolved into a really cool online class when we were closed for the pandemic and we had to pivot so quickly to online learning. Um, but we had an amazing class called Curators, Conservation Science, and the Ceramic Object. And it would be um, our ins amazing instructor, Denny McLaughlin. Uh, we would have a, a piece that we would look at each class and the curators or conservation scientists would be our guest Zoom people. They might lecture a bit it or show x-rays of the piece and then Denny would recreate the piece it's a taboo thing in ceramics about recreating you know ancient pieces and and it's also um very problematic in terms of appropriating sure. cultural objects absolutely and a big conversation we're having still um but with to be careful and put it within that context of of study of bringing it back to the maker taking this object out of the vitrine and let's really talk about what that ancient potter would have been thinking about why did he make the handle that way um you know why was what was this shape um, in context to the function it had so uh, those are cool conversations yeah and i mean harvard is one of the oldest academic i think is it the oldest academic institution yeah. in the u.s mm -hmm in the country. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's like hundreds of years old, but there is a class distinction between the people generally that can afford to go to Harvard and the person that can generally take a clay class. So I, I do like that you guys are also kind of a bridge between, this is a gross over symbolization, but between the rich <laughs> folk and the poor folk, <laughs> because clay definitely at times has a utilitarian vibe that being a philosophy professor at Harvard doesn't. You know, not that that's not valuable. They're both valuable, but they're, it's different groups of people coming together to do ceramics that usually don't, in my mind, don't come together that often. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, I will say over the last few years, and specifically since we came out of the pandemic, the Harvard undergrads have gone from like, again, not wanting to make that mile trek to I think this semester we had 200 waitlisted undergrads to tr trying to oh, get wow. into our classes. Yeah. Now, because we have that mixture, we have X number of adult community, X number of grad students, X number of undergrad make up every class to kind of um, be fair to everybody. Uh, but yeah, I really think the undergrad specifically came back with this like, need uh, or understanding that they needed time for themselves they needed creative space and whatnot but i have noticed a lot of those undergrads are asking for financial help uh, with our classes and so i i do know that harvard does um, uh, give uh, quite a lot of uh, scholarship and financial aid to students and i see that so it's still um, a mixed bag i think that it is expensive for an adult community member who pays at the highest um, slot to be able to afford being with us. But I know that is what it costs. And it's, you know, seven day access and all the materials and da 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 da. It, but it, it's a struggle when it becomes like, you know, for accessibility. And, you know, oh, I just wish I could make this more affordable to some. So we do, you know, provide scholarships. But it's tough when you're very close to being a community 
um, you know, like a nonprofit community center, but to write a grant and say you're writing that you're asking for money be, and with a name like Harvard attached to you yeah, good point. is next to impossible. So I, that's the most difficult part of my job. We, we are, um, as an organization, because we're not linked to a specific department, we are we are 85% self sufficient through oh, registration. Wow. Yeah, and many people don't know that. <laughs> and they see that Harvard name and think I'm like swimming in it and it's it is a struggle. And I know at Harvard that if we were a visual arts center and we offered all over uh, many medium uh, art classes, I think we would probably be better funded. Um by Harvard, they really do. Um, I think that the students are asking for more art making in their lives. Um, I think uh, that Harvard is probably looking at that. It, it's a little tough when you're such an active area, but it's just ceramics, mm -hmm. you know, and I say it's not just ceramics, it's sculpture, it's ceramics, it's drawing, it's, you know, we're drawing for sculpture and all these different things. Like, what do you mean? It's just ceramics. But um, you know, do, do, and this happens in a lot of uh, university departments because we're so tied to the specific equipment. You know, the building is outfitted for ceramics with big kilns and such. So, um, yeah, it, it's a bit of a fight to, you know, keep us um, in the visual arts conversation. Well, I wonder too if like some funding could come through mental health. I mean, I, I don't want to downplay. Mm -hmm the role of art just for art's sake, because I think that is important. But in my interactions with the few students that I talked to when I was there, they were, the the woman that interviewed me for the student paper, I swear was about to cry because she was so stressed. Oh. And after the interview, we were just talking casually. And I was like, so what is it like to be a sophomore at Harvard? And her her wall broke down for a second, and mm -hmm. I could see how freaked out she was oh, by I the bet. whole thing. But when you're working with clay, it gets you out of all of that rigmarole and just gets you into your body. And I feel like that, like mental health funding, they should be paying for that for that reason. <laughs> it's so funny. I just had that same conversation yesterday with um, uh, another entity uh, at Harvard called the Harvard Ed, Ed Portal, and they are kind of a bridge between the uh, Boston communities that are around um, our building. And uh, yeah, we brought that up. And I said, you know, that it's so true. And we talk about that. But to really do it, I feel to uh, give it uh, due diligence, it would need to involve uh, professionals that would be very involved with me in programming. I would not want to take on programming for mental health, you know, and, and use those words. So um, I think it, it's there and pe we, we talk about ceramics as being therapeutic and mindfulness and all that good stuff. But like to do it, boy, you've got to do it right. But I, I agree, Ben. I mean, I do. I and there have been moments where we've had, um, you know, uh, collaborations with the Office of Diversity, Inclusion and Equity, um, you know, uh, providing a safe space for students to come together, do a, a clay um, making, uh, you know, session, but be using that as a way to uh, have a conversation about maybe some more serious issues. So I do try and keep our doors open for those moments. I do think also like the women's studies department, you, your work specifically, I know, I know that the, the center is not just an amplification of you, but you are an asset like for the women's studies department. Aww. You could be so good as a team teacher in one of their, their classes, you know? Oh, thank you so much, Ben. I think I think it would be easier to navigate if we had a doctorate in ceramics, but you know, my little piddly old MFA doesn't necessarily impress like I thought it would. <laughs> Turns out the other PhDs don't care about an MFA. Exactly. So I mean, I think, yeah, it's it's just a matter it it's amazing how sprawling and complex Harvard is. And, you know, I've been there almost 10 years and it's like, still, I don't, you know, I haven't, you know, got gotten through the walls of some department. So I hope I do. And I do try, I, I do keep my 
ceramic life kind of away from my director life. Um, it was a little bit more intertwined at the beginning. I used to make work at the studio. I still try and teach as much as I can because I don't think I should be a director unless I'm, um, if I'm not actively teaching within the space. Um, that for sure makes me a better uh, leader. But uh, I guess as I get older, it's I'm more protective about my private time and um, my studio. And so I moved my studio out to my dad's house in about half an hour away when my mom passed. And it was basically to just check up on him and make sure he was, you know, going food shopping and all that. And by God, now my dad is into working with clay himself, though. He's like, okay, <laughs> enough with the hot rods. We're going to, you know, oh, use my cool. studio. It is cool. So he makes these awesome faces that are intended to be like put up on trees outside. They're so incredibly cool. And um, yeah, it's just a really great way to get to know my dad in a different way is, um, and, but it, it, what's funny is like last weekend, he's showing me these glaze tests I made him make. <laughs> and he's like, well, I don't understand why it doesn't look like what's on the bottle. And I'm like, you know what? <laughs> Welcome to my world. <laughs> Welcome to ceramics. <laughs> exactly. He's, but it should do this. Why did it crack? I don't understand. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> Well, this is a perfect segue to talk about for Flex Sake, which is a oh, podcast good. that you host, where people write in and ask uh, Matt and Rose Katz from the Ceramic Materials Workshop, why basically what your dad said, why does my glaze, test, glaze mm -hmm. test not look like the bottle? And they ask it in all these different ways. So can you talk about that podcast? Because you guys are getting ready to launch your second season. Yeah. Well, at the <laughs> at the get-go, when Matt called me um, to pass this idea by, I said, I am, I will do it if I don't have to answer the questions. <laughs> and even though, you know, I've got 25 years of experience teaching ceramics, it, there is something um, so enjoyable <laughs> about not having to answer it for once and to let Rose and Matt do it, you know, and do it so well. Um, and I think the most fascinating part of all this is how they dispel all these myths you know, and I've been doing this long enough that there's, I, I wish I could think of one right now, but um, all these different myths that we have in, in ceramics and rules and whatnot. And I just love, you know, Lord Celsius and <laughs> his ability to just, you know, be like, yeah, we fire the kiln like on fast, you know, it's like done in three hours to cone 10, you know, and I'm like, wait a minute, you can't do that, you know, but it's just a blast and um, I adore them and they're just so smart and funny and I love making fun of Matt and that's at the end of the day, the whole reason why I do it. That is, that is the whole reason. <laughs> so let, let's talk about your sense of humor though, because you're a bill, you're so fast that you come up with jokes faster than he comes up with answers for the questions, <laughs> which is a good light balance to that. That's our magic. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. I think I've always, um, my parents are funny. You know, my sister's funny. We always had a really, um, quick sense of humor around the house and, you know, very sarcastic, uh, which has gotten me in trouble over the time. But I used to have a fantasy in my twenties that there would be a stand up um, comedy part of Ensika. And I was like, so ready to, you know, try and get into this because there's just so many things to make fun of, you know. Um, <laughs> and I, I remember I'd like try and run through, you know, uh, sticks in my head. But, you know, be doing that kind of comedy, like I, it's being a comedian doing stand up. I've had friends who do stand up. That is so hard you know and it's the same reason like when people say why don't you draw graphic novels and i'm like because it's so hard <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know i have the utmost respect but oh my goodness that is an art unto itself so um i'm happy to just uh try try and keep it light and also try and keep the humor in the work i i do think oh as i'm getting older it's not as funny. It's not as um, one-liner-ish as uh, I used in my, my youth. And I think that's just probably me mellowing out, um, me uh, just getting older and, you know, playing with 
different voices, I guess, and how I, I present things. You know, and I would say too, like the lack um, of, of text. So humor and uh, text in the work uh, always went hand in hand. And it was uh, very problematic for me uh, for the first couple of decades because I'm like, oh, I'm using so much text. Am I just giving it away here? Is it, I'm using text like advertising or signage. Um, and I, I, I went through a number of years where I was like, okay, I'm not gonna use text. I'm just gonna try and get the idea across. And it was a little harder being funny without the text you know um so um that's something i still think about today about when i'm very thoughtful of when using text or not and i wonder too as our digital lives change how we think about fonts differently because when i look at your work in the 90s that you had hand-drawn fonts you know that yeah. you were graffitoing yeah. out of things but then i think now like is the student coming into your class that's 18 are they thinking this font means something different than the fact that you just drew it because that's what you drew, you know? Like, is there all this meaning in the fonts that we choose now? Yeah, well, I think um, the rise and um, acceptability of tattoo culture really made a big impact um, on how fonts are uh, or the fonts that I use are um, recognized because when I started, I thought it was like, oh, you know, this is kind of coming from hot rod culture. And I was pulling from that. And then, you know, maybe 10 years later, it's like, oh, I can download all these, you know, and it, it was almost overwhelming in the choices that I had. And, you know, in the same way, um, my style of drawing, it's could I draw that face better if I, you know, practiced and paid more attention, perhaps. <laughs> but I, I've kind of, I accepted early on, you know, my pots are not the lightest. They get kind of a lumpy quality to them. Um, my drawing style is my drawing style, you know, doing the text. I will quite often misjudge the amount of space I have um, to put those letters in there. And if you notice like an N got really, really compressed, you know, it's <laughs> like, <laughs> or to go back to the, at the beginning of the conversation, that birth control bed, I remember putting the tile uh, that uh, said diaphragm on the headboard and my um, roommate walking by and uh, saying, you know, you know, there's a G in that. And I was like, God <laughs> damn it. <laughs> so I had to remake that part. <laughs> Oh my God, that's hilarious. I'm such a bad speller that I, I could know. not do something like that. <laughs> Spell check is your friend. <sighs> well, to wrap up, can you plug your website so, or social media so people could get in touch and then also the podcast where they can find it? Oh, absolutely. So um, to find me, uh, my website is not as fabulous as it could be, but everything, my, so, my Instagram, Facebook, everything is... In, Twitter is all Kathy King art. I'm, I think, um, uh, focused more on uh, Instagram right now. Um, I have a secret love of TikTok that I'm exploring. Can't help it. And uh, then the the podcast is yeah, season two is going to come out soon. And um, again, we're always looking for questions. So if anybody can send an audio file to for flux sake podcast at gmail.com, that'd be awesome. And uh, you find the podcast through um, the Bray podcast series at your favorite podcast provider. Well, thanks. Uh, it was good to talk to you. Thank you, Ben. I'd like to thank Kathy for coming on the show. I also wanted to congratulate her on the second season of For Flex Sake, which has just launched. You can find that wherever you download your podcast, including the app that you're listening to this episode on. So make sure to check that out. Also wanted to take a minute to thank our sponsors, namely the Michiana Pottery Tour, which is happening this weekend, September the 24th and 25th in northern Indiana and southern Michigan as well as Amico Brent and Scut Ceramic Products. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor on the show, you can get in touch through the network website. That's brickyardnetwork.org. I'll be back next week with another episode. Thank you all for tuning in.
If you'd like more information on the artists on the show, or if you'd like more information about the workshops and events that I'll be having in the next couple months, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under Carter Pottery. Another great way to support the show is to leave me a comment on iTunes. To do that, search Tales of a Red Clay Rambler under iTunes Podcasts, and you'll find a page that's linked to our show. Thank you guys for the support. We respectfully acknowledge and honor all indigenous communities whose lands we reside on in the United States and recognize that we are uninvited guests on the occupied, unceded, and ancestral lands of over 500 nations indigenous to North America. By acknowledging and reflecting upon the contemporary lived experiences and histories of the indigenous peoples here and globally, we may begin to take essential steps towards creating a more equitable world. Learn more through the hashtag Honor Native Land Initiative of the U.S. Department of Arts and Culture and consider contributing to Indigenous-led organizations doing important work to further health and wellness, sovereignty, and self-determination of the first people of the lands you reside. This podcast is a production of the Brickyard Network, an extension of the Archie Bray Foundation for the Ceramic Arts. To find out more about our lineup of ceramic podcasts, visit brickyardnetwork.org.